My name is Todd Merlin Compton, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm really excited to have Dr. Todd Compton on the show. It's about time. Uh, he's the author of a couple of books, both of them called In Sacred Loneliness, but the new one is subtitled The Documents. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, both of his books, In Sacred Loneliness and In Sacred Loneliness, The Documents. So these are two fantastic books. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about polygamy, um, some of the early days, and get his opinions. There were some really surprising ones uh, in this episode, uh, dealing with uh, people like Helen Mark Kimball and Sylvia Sessions Lyon and some things like that. So I talked to Todd last month in the... Um, John Whitmer Historical Association, the 50th uh, anniversary of that organization. So it was back in Independence. And uh, you'll notice he's wearing this shirt on. I thought I would show it to you full view so that uh, so you could see what he was wearing. So anyway, um, check out our conversation with Dr. Todd Compton. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have one of the icons of Mormon history <laughs> here today. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are? Uh, um, I'm Dr. Todd M. Compton, and this is Gospel Tangents. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I always like to, to do is get my uh, uh, my guest's background, where he went to school. I believe you went to BYU and UCLA, is that right? Can you tell us about right. a little bit more about that? Yeah, I started out, of course, high school at Provo High. Oh, you're a bulldog. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and then I went to Snow College for two years, okay. majored in music. Then I went to BYU and majored in English. And then I started doing graduate work in classics, which is ancient Greek and Latin. Oh. And then I did... Was that so you could learn the Bible? Well, I was a Nibley fan. Okay. You know, me and a couple of my friends, we took all the Nibley classes we could. And, and so... I got interested in, in the ancient world, and so that was one, you know, I, I got interested actually when I was living in South America, in Peru. And was that where you went on a mission or something? No, my dad taught Spanish at BYU, and he, he was on sabbatical for a year, so we went and lived in Peru, and um, so um, I visited all the... Um, great museums, you know, dealing with the ancient world, you know, the Incas and the people before them. And You know, uh, some people think the Book of Mormon took place there in Peru. Yeah. That's, were you aware of that at the time? one geography, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they were more interested in Mesoamerican geography, like G the John Sorensen right. um, geography at that time. And... Um, so I wasn't interested for that reason. It, it just got really exciting going to these sites and, and thinking about, you know, these really ancient time periods. And so anyway, back, back at BYU, I eventually decided to do Greek and Latin. And um, I have, you know, I pick up languages fairly well. Um, and so I was able to, to work on that. And then I went to UCLA doing ancient Greek and Latin. And, um, and then at UCLA, um, oh, we're segueing into how I wrote In Sacred Loneliness. Oh, perfect. Is that That's totally in accordance fine. with you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I, I taught for a year after I got my doctorate. I taught for a year at USC and then the job market was really, really tough. Yeah. And um, it still is tough, I think. It's always tough. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And um, so I, was, I ended up not, not teaching and um, not knowing what I was going to do. It was a really tough period of my life. Um, what, you know, here's everything I worked for, and it d didn't seem to be working out. And while I was in that period, a friend of mine um, who had went, gone to, I had known her in the singles ward in 
LA and then she went to University of Utah and did a doctorate in Mormon history but she we were talking one time and she said Todd why don't you I think she wrote this to me I know she wrote this to me but she said why don't you but we talked also she said why don't you get one of these summer fellowships at the Huntington Library which oh. is fabulous yeah. library gardens in Pasadena and um, they have a really great Mormon collection because Juanita Brooks was affiliate you know associated with the Huntington Library for quite a while and and the weather's really nice there. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, beautiful gardens and so she said why don't you get uh, one of these fellowships and uh, where they pay you to to study something and she said they have the Eliza R. Snow journals, diaries there. So why don't you apply to work on the Eliza R. Snow diaries? And, and you know, they'll pay you to come to the Huntington every day. And I, I thought it was a crazy idea because I had no background in Mormon history. Yeah, so your, your doctorate was in Greek and Latin? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'd always been interested in Mormon history. Right. And... Um, but I'd never done any research in it. And I had done, I'd started doing research in women in the ancient world. So I was interested in women in religion. Oh, wow. So I had a bit of background there. And um, so I thought it was a crazy idea, but my friend, Janet, she, she sent me a letter and she said, here, you know, go ahead and this is how you submit your application and here's what what I think you should say <laughs> so I thought well she's basically written it for me and um, <laughs> it won't take too much time so I you know went ahead with the application and um, sent it in and I really didn't think I was qualified to get it you know because I wasn't in Mormon history at all and I didn't think I would get it and but the job so market's totally not forgot bad it. in Mormon history, I guess, right? But what? The job market's not bad in Mormon history. <laughs> uh, I wasn't thinking about getting a job in Mormon history. You know, like, well, I wasn't expecting to, to get the fellowship, you know. And so I sent it in, and then I totally forgot about it because I was sure I wouldn't get it. Right. And... Um, then, and yeah, I got a letter in the mail, you know, you've received the fellowship, you know, to work on the diaries of Eliza R. Snow wow. for a couple months. You know, and so I said, okay, um, I'll go down and I'll work on Eliza Snow and I'll work on, a, you know, some of my other classic stuff that's there too. And, and um, but, you know, I, I felt obligated to work on the Eliza R. Snow diaries. And so um, the first day I went there, I walked in, you know, and went to the reading room and ordered those diaries. And um, they were these little small diaries, quite small, you know, and you open it up and um, there's Eliza R. Snow's handwriting quite quite small and um, she'd be writing you know like she'd be traveling crossing the plains they were her plains diaries so she'd cross the plains during the day and at night I guess she'd sit by the fire and write the account of the day and it was really exciting to me to get you know to see someone's actual handwriting you know and in, in Greek and Latin texts there, you have copies of copies of copies of copies, and um, and you know having a autograph written by one of these ancient writers is totally unheard of, and so it was really exciting to me, and yeah. I found that the Eliza R. Snow diary had been published like in the improvement era, but it wasn't a scholarly transcription and there were no footnotes. And 
So I started getting a text for that diary on my computer and you know I started to do footnotes and um, and so that was something that I really enjoyed doing um, you know like footnoting that diary and trying to figure out it's it's really a um, history is like a detective a tech detective game and there's a word you don't understand that Eliza R. Snow is using and you, you look it up and try to find out what it means and you understand the text better, you know, and often the word you don't understand is a name, okay? And so you need to look it up and find out who it is. And uh, one thing annotators do when you publish a text is you have a little mini biography of that person, you know, if you can, birth date, death date, a little bit about their marriages, maybe if you know, if they're in any church offices or you know, what their, how they made money, how they survived. Um, you can put a lot into one of these little mini biographies. And one of my models in doing this was Juanita Brooks, who, you know, had helped get the Mormon collection going at the Huntington Library. And so she was one of my my heroes and models, and she wrote these wonderful little mini texts in, in texts she edited. She edited the, helped edit, collaborated on the John D. Lee journals, and then she did Hosea Stout journals. You know, wonderful scholarly contributions. And um, so, I, she was kind of a model. So um, she herself was, had been a plural wife of Joseph Smith. And then she became a plural wife of Brigham Young and um, lived in the Brigham Young family and uh, in the rest of her life. And there's a whole, obviously a whole story there that I'm not getting into, but I felt like you know, I was starting to try to identify some of these women she's referring to. And um, often she would say just the last name. So she would say, Sister Buell. Okay, so my task, my detective task was find out who Sister Buell was. And, um, and I, f off I found out often you couldn't, you know, just look it up someplace, you know, um, sometimes you could. Google didn't exist back then. Did oh, it? no. The, <laughs> the internet was in its infancy, and um, there were no primary texts on the internet, and um, so, you know, there were certain, you know, you go to Andrew Jensen's biographical encyclopedia, um, you go to other, you know, I might go to other texts that Juanita Brooks had worked on and see if she referred to that person, if he's a, he or she is in the index. And, um, and one issue I faced is there'd been more work done on the men than the women. Right. Another problem was that the men, their names never changed. Right. And the problem with the women is their names were often changing when they get married. And then first husband would die, they would marry someone else. And so in, you know, at a certain time period in the diaries, she's called Sister Goldsmith, you know, in the next 10 years, she's known as Sister Brackenberry. And then the next 10 years in, in um, Nauvoo, she's known as Sister Durfee. And I'm thinking of Elizabeth Davis, that's her birth name. Um, Goldsmith, Brackenbury, Durfee, then she married Joseph Smith, Smith, <laughs> and then she married, oh, who was it? Was it Lot? Okay. And uh, one other person, but she didn't stick with, with him. And um, so now we know that, you know, this, you know, Sister Goldsmith is the same as Sister Brackenberry, who is the same as Sister um, 
Durfee. And she was quite well known in Nauvoo as Sister Durfee. But we didn't know, you know, that connection when I, when I started out. And so... Well, it's because of you that we know the connection, right? <laughs> yeah, for, for Sister Durfee, yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, so I got interested in, okay, for all of these women, it would be good if I had lists of the Joseph Smith wives and the Brigham Young wives and the Heber C. Kimball wives because they were all very close to each other. And um, and so um, the Brigham Young wives, there's a pretty good list by Jeffrey Johnson with footnotes, you know, an article in, I think it was Dialogue. You know, so that was a great source for the Brigham Young wives. And Heber C. Kimball, there was a biography great biography of Heber C. Kimball by Stan Kimball and he had a he had an appendix where he went through all of the wives and their kids you know so that was great for the Heber C. Kimball wives but I couldn't find a good list of Joseph Smith's wives and the best I could find was uh, Fawn Brody No Man Knows My History and she had an appendix with all of the you know, a lot of Joseph Smith's wives, but I started working with that and I found a lot of problems with it. And With Fawn Brody's list of wives? Fawn Brody's list. And one was, it was really out of date. You know, like, I was, what, 30 or 40 years later. Right. And Because uh, she wrote in the 50s? Yeah, what was it? So, 40? So, I was starting to do this, like, 1994, 1993. Okay. And... Uh, so really out of date, and um, she had this, I wouldn't call it an anti-Mormon bias, but she used a lot of anti-Mormon sources that were late, you know, and I really didn't know if I could trust them, you know, and you know, if you have problem sources, you look at them, you know, and you see if there's backup with any other source, you know, you have this, you know, for any problem source, you go through that. You know, if it's late, you know, sometimes a late source can be good. It can be helpful, and but it's good to get back up with another source. And if, it, if something is controversial, then you want more backup, you know, and more sources. And, you know, the Joseph Smith wives, Joseph Smith's polygamy was controversial, kind of a taboo subject among Mormons. So, um, I, I started to work with, with um, Fawn Brody's list, but it had a lot of problems. So, I just started making my own list. And back on Elizabeth Davis, um, Durfee, Goldsmith, Brackenbury, Durfee, Smith, Lot. Um, back on her, um, she was listed twice in Fawn Brody's list. You know, and once she's listed as, as um, I think, Brackenbury, and once she's listed as Durfee. Oh, so thinking they're two she different She hadn't people. made the connection, yeah. And, and it's, it's a really, I mean, it, it's hard to blame her because... She was a pioneer. Yeah, and she had separate husbands, and she was known by a different name in every period of her history. You know, that's just one of the problems of working with uh, women's history and in, in Mormon history and history throughout the world, you know, is that often they're known by their husband's name instead of their maiden name. And so I remember working on Elizabeth Davis, you know, it's like it was a triumph every time I got one of those connections, you know, and so I knew Elizabeth Davis was... Elizabeth Durfee, and so on. So, anyway, so I started making my own list of Joseph Smith's wives and um, started writing my little mini biographies. And um, and so I found out that, you know, sometimes if you're lucky, you can find another mini biography and work with that. But um, often you're starting from scratch almost. And so... 
um, it really helped if you found a diary or an autobiography um, or a reference in a newspaper and um, and you know if you found a reference in a diary you would say oh okay I know Hannah Els was living in Nauvoo in um, 1845 in May 1845 you know and you so you get a residence history and and you you figure out the the names you know with remarriages and you know some women were quite simple <laughs> You know, in their marriage history, you know, they married one person. And so all you had to do is find the maiden name and find her name. And, you know, then if you can find a birth name and a death date, a, I mean, a birth date and a death date, that was great. You know, and the name of the husband and the name of the kids. And you fill all those things in and it's great, you know. And But I found out if you found a really good source you know, a primary source that can really help in those mini biographies. And so while I was at the Huntington, I started branching out and um, from branching out from Eliza R. Snow's diary to um, the diaries of, of her sister wives, you know, and the writings of her sister wives. And um, so one was uh, Zina Diantha Huntington, that's her maiden name, and then her married names were Jacobs, Smith, Young, and so, no relation to the Huntington Library, right? <laughs> no, no, it's a common name. Yeah, they're connected with the the railroad, the railroad magnate Huntington, the California Railroad oh, okay. owner. Um, so anyway, I found at the Huntington. I had access to the diaries of her brother, uh, Oliver Huntington. He wrote these, you know, diaries throughout his life. And so I just, you know, they're paying me to go there and work on Eliza R. Snow. So I had time, you know, and I just sat down and, you know, took a few days and I read through all of those Oliver Hunting Diaries, Oliver Huntington Diaries, and they were on film. They didn't have the originals, but they were on film. You could very readable, and so I just. And then I took notes, and and he was always talking about two of his sisters married Joseph Smith, Presendia and and Zina, and so I would take notes, um, you know, and I could get the residence history of those these two women and a lot about their background and often people would write their diaries but they'd start out with a little autobiography because they weren't keeping diaries when they were kids you know so they'd they'd start out with a autobiography and then start switch to the diary at some point and that would be helpful for me so um and one diary that really had a big impact on me was Eliza R. Snow and as people may know, if they know a little background on Joseph Smith and his marriages, he married the Partridge sisters, Emily Partridge and Eliza Partridge, who lived in his home as, as teenagers. And, um, and so they both were really wonderful writers. And uh, Emily wrote wonderful memoirs of her marriage to Joseph Smith and growing up near Kirtland and on her dad's hat farm, uh, hat making farm. <laughs> he was a hatter, but he, he lived on a farm. And but Eliza later, she married Amasa Lyman, one of the apostles, and um, ended up kind of in central Utah near Fillmore. But her son, Platt Lyman, was called to go on the Hole in the Rock mission in um, east, southeastern Utah. And so that was one of the last great frontiers of Utah. And you had to, we've been talking about how hard it was for Jacob Hamlin to cross the Colorado River because you had to go down these really 
difficult trails to get down to the Colorado. Then it was a big task to get across the Colorado. And then often it was difficult on the other side to get, you know, away from the Colorado and get back up onto where you had, you know, um, smooth land again. So anyway, the hole in the rock company had to, had to do that. Wow. So Eliza wasn't there, but Platt Lyman came home after a year and convinced her to go with him back down there, his mother, Eliza. And so, and she kept a really fine diary of it. And so she had, um, in this diary, before she went on the hole on the rock, she, her, her daughter married um, in a polygamous marriage, and um, and it was problematic. Um, Eliza's marriage was polygamous marriage was problematic, and so her daughter's marriage was problematic without getting into details. And then her daughter died, and Eliza kept a full diary of the whole thing and Eliza, I don't, Eliza Partridge right Eliza Partridge Smith Lyman never remarried after Lyman died well they that's another story they separated at, at one point because he left the church um, but so this daughter in this problematic Plumas family she she got after her child her first child um she got really really sick and had an excruciating sickness and and died and it was incredibly painful for eliza and i don't know how she did it you know when when i'm doing something like when i come to a conference like the john whitmer association conference yeah. nice yeah. shirt by the way yeah <laughs> there we are we just went to it uh, the 2022 50th anniversary conference. Um, but I'm too tired to, to write. In a, I don't write in a diary anyway. I should. I keep thinking I ought to start. <laughs> and But I'm too tired to do anything. I go to sleep when I go home. Right. And But she was kept this faithful, full diary. And um, it was really moving to, to read it. And so I started... You know, and I, I felt like I really knew her. You know, and then she went down to to southeastern Utah and kept a really full diary down there. And her son was pursuing outlaws who had rustled some horses. And there was a gunfight, um, I think, on the Colorado River. And um, he got shot in the leg. He had a really bad wound in his leg. And... Um, so she gave a full explanation of that, you know, and it's just, and it was um, a wonderful diary, you know, so and she has this precise, wonderful style, and um, and you can tell her love for her, her children, like her son Joseph, who was shot, and the ordeal he went through healing from this wound, and... Um, and I forgot to mention that this daughter, this child, her son, or her daughter who died, uh, had a child who survived. And because she had this problematic relationship with her um, husband, she decided, she told him, you know, she said, I don't want you and your family raising my child. I want my mother to raise the child. And so... When Eliza went down to um, Southern Utah, she she took this child who was named Joseph with her, and and she talks about raising him. And anyway, it's a wonderful diary, and that's uh, so that's another thing that really hooked me toward continuing writing about these plural wives of Joseph Smith. Is you know I began finding these wonderful documents that were. Um, Often very moving, often fascinating. You know, and sometimes they they talked about the daily life, which isn't as dramatic, but it's it's really interesting to see what their daily life is like. And um, so you're kind of an accidental Mormon historian, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, for Mormon history. Oh, and by the way, 
um, you know, I have a, you know, this new book, the sequel, in Sacred Loneliness, the do- in Sacred Loneliness, the documents, which just appeared a few yeah. days ago. The That's 12th. why we're here. I I yeah. got mine on Monday, and I was uh, like, oh, I can get them to sign it. This is yeah. awesome. <laughs> anyway, it has generous excerpts from Eliza R. Snow's. I mean, Eliza. Eliza R. Snow, too, but Eliza um, Bartridge Lyman and it has generous excerpts from her diary and, and so on. And in my first book, yeah, I'm, I'm going ahead here. But. No, that's absolutely fine because I wanted to talk about your first book anyway. Yeah. So. In the but, first book, I, I have you know excerpts, but they're part of narrative history. You know, like I tell the stories of each of the women, and each woman has a separate chapter. You know, and I quote from the women. I wanted their voice there, but they're not, you know. In this book, it's all quotations. So, um, uh, so let's see. This where is more was kind I? of a primary source book, in a way. This is a primary source book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the documents. Yeah. So that's how you can tell the title is has the documents there. Right. You know, which also explains the book. Um, and so... Between those two things, you know, like, just I was just getting fascinated with writing these little mini histories, which were turning into into a book. longer histories. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, so I'd have I had these, you know, they turned into, you know, I had a outline history for each woman, you know, and I would just keep adding adding to each each of these outlines, and. Um, and eventually I said, well, eventually I found out that um, Maureen Ersenbach Beecher contacted me. And she was a historian at, at BYU. And she had been working on the Eliza R. Snow diaries oh. for a long time. And so I think... She wanted your research. <laughs> well... I, I think she didn't want me to do the to to do the diaries and bring them out before her. Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, she contacted me and we talked about you know what we were doing and so I was happy to let her go ahead with the Eliza Snow diaries and in se- instead I focused on the the plural wise of Joseph Smith. Oh, and that's how we got in Sacred Loneliness. Yeah. Oh wow. The first book. And um so you know, I I helped her somewhat with with her book because I was right there at the Huntington and I could check things and um, and she helped me and uh, I remember going down to from Provo, Utah, and um, so I went to high school there and um, junior high. And so I had family there, so I'd go to Provo, and I'd live in Provo, and um, and I'd go to BYU, and um, uh, I'm going ahead of myself again. But my memory was I went and visited Maureen at BYU at her office, and she she shared a whole bunch of documents with me, oh, you know, because nice. obviously she was focusing on Eliza Snow, so a lot of Eliza Snow's friends were plural wise, former plural wise of Joseph Smith. And so we helped each other at that point, you know. And so I was totally focused on the plural wise of Joseph Smith. And um, one element that that became, and part of this detective work, part of history, okay, which is one of the two things that really drew me into the book. And Everyone who does research kind of has that same experience. You know, if you do family history of your ancestors or if you're doing a biography of a politician like, you know, who knows, George Washington. You know, there's always this detective um, excitement about, you know, finding new documents and there's problems you know, like things that don't make sense, and you just keep working on that, getting more documents, and eventually it makes sense, you know, if you're lucky, if you find the right documents. But 
with with me, I, I found some special problems with the Joseph Smith wives was that um, a number of them, about a third of them, they married they married men in civil unions, and so they were married. And then, while they were married to these men, um, they married Joseph Smith. Okay. And so, when I found out that was going on, then I just tried to document what was going on, you know, find sources, find documents that talked about, you know, what was happening. And so, it, this was a problem. What are... What was the di what were the dynamics of these marriages, and um, did she you know did so? Let's take one. one of the most before you go there, okay. I want to just ask a couple questions about Eliza Snow and Eliza Partridge, and Elizabeth too. Uh, there's the famous story where uh, Emma pushed Eliza down the stairs. Were you able to document whether that was a true story or a false story? As I mentioned earlier, um, if you have a problematic source, what you try to do is you try to find something that supports it. Okay? And so that is, it's a family history. It's from the Snow family. And um, it's late. Okay? Which is a problem. Know, I don't like to call it a problem, but it's an issue. It's an issue, yeah. And so, if something is late, you need it. It helps to find something that to to support it. And um, so, it's it's never been supported by any other source that I know of. Okay. Okay. And so, in that kind of situation. You say, okay, here's, here, you know, here's the document, here's the story. Um, you know, and you look at things like, does this make sense? Yeah. And if it doesn't make sense, that's a problem. <laughs> and is this in conflict with other documents? You know, um, would other sources have talked about this? And um, you ask these questions. This is just standard for all of history. You know, and um, some people just say it's late, you know, so. I'm going to throw it away. Yeah, I'm going to throw it away. I'm not like that at all, you know, and um, oh, I could talk about that in more depth. But, but you know, as far as, you know, as far as I know, and it's been a long time since I actually, you know, I looked at that when I was at the Huntington and... Um, Linda King Newell wrote an article about it. Well, and I think Don Bradley has basically come out and said, yeah, the story's not true. Yeah, and so, and she, I think Linda Newell cast doubt on it also. So, you know, you say, okay, here's this story. It's a family story. It's late. You know, it, in some ways it doesn't make sense. It conflicts with something else. And, um, and so, you know, you let the reader know that, it may not be true. You know, and you say, and this authority on Emma and um, the Joseph Smith household, Linda King Newell, she believes that, you know, it has problems that she kind of rejects it. And so that's how you work with it. You know, but you keep it open in your mind, will we find another document that supports it? You never know, you know, and... Sometimes that happens. You have a problem document, and then you find another document that supports it. And was this over Emma? I mean, the story is Emma was upset because Eli Eliza Snow was not only a secret wife of Joseph, but she was a counselor with Emma in the Relief Society presidency, right? She was a secretary. Secretary. So, she was um, a friend. Yeah, so they were friends, yeah. and... You know, the story is this is over polygamy and that... And the story is that I think that Eliza R. Snow was pregnant. Right. And um, Emma pushed her down the stairs and then she had a miscarriage or something right, like that. Right, That's right. the story. And so... 
I guess the other question is, well, if it's not true, why would the family come up with the story? Yeah, you know, you here here again. You you look at things like, were they mad at Emma? So did they come up with this story? You know, and I think this was from the Lorenzo Snow family. Okay, were they mad at Emma? Is this part of propaganda against Emma that we know was happening in, in, in Utah for sure in Utah at that time and um, so other people explain Eliza R. Snow never having kids by the fact that possibly she was um, raped in, right. in Missouri Andrea Radke Moss I think right. said that and so she was gang raped basically and that could I don't, I'm not a doctor, but I, I guess that could affect you so you wouldn't have kids. So that could be an explanation for why she didn't have kids. And maybe they didn't want to talk about that, and they came up, you know, the Snow family came up with a different explanation. So, yeah, you look at, if you have a problem document or problem situation, you look at all the sources and try to make sense of it. So are you still open to the, it possibly can, could be true, but you just can't confirm it? Is that, was that kind of yeah. what you are? Yeah, uh, I forget exactly what I wrote about it, but, you know, you never know. You know, will another document come along or, or not? You know, and will the document be like a contemporary? That will help if it's a contemporary source and so on. Um, but I, at, at this point, I would say I don't accept it. You know, I would okay. say if I were, you know, if you pulled a gun on me and told me I had to say yes or no, <laughs> I'd say no at this point, you know. <laughs> no, no weapons here. <laughs> There's some things like another, one of those situations is, did Joseph Smith consummate his marriage with the 14-year-old Helen Mar Whitney? Oh, yeah. And... I remember Gary Bergera kind of really wanted to get me to say what I thought. This is just on the phone. You know, and I said, well, you know, there's no actual documentation. You know, and usually in a marriage, there is no documentation in someone's diaries. Yeah, people don't say, I had <laughs> or sex autobiography. Was great. You know, they don't say that. There's no documentation for that. And... The documentation is if they have kids, right? you know, that shows there were sexual relations. But sometimes there are no kids and they had sexual relations. And for medical reasons, the wife or the husband can't have kids. And so anyway, so um, so with with Gary, I said, well, you know, he didn't pull a gun on me, but, you know, he really <laughs> wondered what I thought about that. And I said, I think that it was not. Um, consummated and really there were parallels in Utah where people married girls teenagers that young and then they did not consummate them until later so I said it, there at least there's that parallel that it might be the same pattern here in Nauvoo so well and I, I know we're we're really going ahead of Stay the tangent. That's okay. Of the linear story. Here. This is where the interesting stuff happens usually. Anyway, so because because that's been a big position of Brian Hales is that uh, Joseph didn't consummate anything with Helen. You called her Helen Mar Whitney, Helen Mar Kimball. Helen Mar Kimball Whitney. So well, it's like fifteen. It's Helen Mar Kim right? Helen Mar Kimball Smith Whitney. Okay. But she married um, Horace Whitney the brother of Sarah Ann Whitney, another wife of Joseph Smith. So she married Horace Whitney and had a number of kids with Horace Whitney, and so she was widely known as Helen Marr Whitney. Yeah, okay. so one of the things that... She's often most broadly known by her last married name, you know, so often oh. they call her Helen Marr Whitney. Oh, I usually hear her as Helen Marr Kimball, but anyway... That's, that's the main name. That's so. the main name. That's, you know, often when I do my own organizing things, like in my computer... I go by the maiden name because that never changes. You know? Right. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. So one of the things Brian said, and I'd be curious about your opinion on this, uh, especially with regards to Helen Mar, Kimball Whitney <laughs> Smith, um, <laughs> is there was no law of adoption, and he, he thought of it more of as an, even though it was a marriage or a ceiling, 
it was more of uh, that was the only way to seal families together because law of adoption kind of came later. Is, yeah. that, is that a reasonable explanation yeah. for you? Well, yeah, there's law of adoption. We usually call that, use that with men being adopted into someone else's family. Into, you know, like a man being adopted into Brigham Young's family. Yeah, like John D. Lee and Brigham Young. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was done with Joseph Smith, too. Like, I would like to have my family adopted into the Joseph Smith family right. after he died. Okay. Well, that theology just didn't exist, and so the only way to tie families together was through marriage sealing. Okay, so there are, for marriages, then and now, there were multiple reasons for marriage. You know, like, you know, and it's a healthy thing for there to be physical attraction. You know, it's a normal, healthy thing for there to be physical attraction in marriages. Um monogamous and um, polygamous too so I you know people go too far in saying oh there was no sexual attraction in Joseph Smith's marriages and why not I mean it was a healthy normal part of polygamous marriages any marriage okay so um, but there can be you know um, other motivations too that are kind of not taking over the whole motivation, but also part of the motivation. And like, uh, um, one can be, you know, if, if you're really close to another family, you know, you might marry into the family and there could be good, you know, healthy attraction there also. And, um, you know, but you also might like to marry into this family you admire so much. Okay, so... Um, so there definitely, there definitely was, you know, like Heber C. Kimball wanted this connection with, with Joseph Smith. And so it was done with uh, the marriage to, to Helen Marr. And some, some marriages were more economic. Like yeah, there were, being... in history, there's lots of economic reasons for marriages. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes there was no attraction at all. It was all... You know, a political reason, you know, we need our families to be connected. And, um, you know, or a, a financial reason. And, oh, you, you go into the history of ancient Rome, you know, and uh, a father would marry his daughter. And the daughter had no say in it, you know, but he would want a political connection with someone else. Right. And um, I mean, saying, is that what Joseph's thinking was? Is these are kind of political connections with the Kimball family or something? Or I don't know if we'd call them political. Would we call them religious, eternal? Um, so I think this. I call it dynastic. You okay. know, like connecting families. That's one word that's used. And so I think that was. You know, as I say, there are multiple reasons for every marriage possibly, and um, so. You might have you might have attraction, but also this dynastic motivation also. So, would you take issue with some who would say Joseph was a pedophile because he married Helen Marr? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I just went to um, Hales. What's his first name? Brian. Brian. Yeah. Okay. I went to his session at Sunstone, and it was just kind of an overview of of Joseph Smith's polygamy, and I missed the first half. But <laughs> he ended by, he mentioned that during his main talk, he said, um, you know, if it were, and this is kind of interesting, because he's, quite, you know, he's, he's known as a um, defender of, Brigham Young, um, Joseph Smith, right. which I think he is overall. But he said, you know, if it were up to me and I could go back and whisper in his ear, in his ear, Joseph Smith's ear, I would advise him to, to do polygamy in different ways. <laughs> and so we just said that and went on. But during question and answer, someone raised their hand and said, could you be more specific about, you know, what ways you would advise Joseph Smith not to 
uh, <laughs> Joseph Smith not to do his polygamy. And so he said someplace he in his either in his website or one of his books he has gone through you know the the things he would have done differently. And, oh, really? But he himself right there he went through five things and one was he he would have advised him not to marry you know really young teenagers <laughs> <laughs> and he would have advised him not to marry um, men women who were married to to other men right um, so um, so where were we You're, are we still talking about Helen Marr so there was definitely that dynast, dynastic connection Heber C Kimball wanted this this family connection with Joseph Smith, and they used seedlings to do that. And, and you would reject the pedophile label? Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't use the pedophile label. Um, so this was more of a dynastic we don't have We don't have it documented that it was consummated. He might have gone through the pattern that we, we find in Utah sometimes of waiting before there was sexual relations. However, you know, I think it, it is problematic that he would marry someone at that age. And I think it's problematic, this idea of, you know, men saying, well, we're going to use a marriage to a daughter to connect ourselves. Um, I think it's not fair to the daughter, definitely. Well, and, and didn't Helen feel that way? Yes, she was very, very disturbed by it. The mother, Valate, was disturbed by it. Her mother, the wife of um, Heber C. Kimball. And Helen, Helen Marr left a wonderful um, memoir of her marriage to Joseph Smith. And it was addressed to her kids. And again, this is another one of these late documents, you know, that I think is extremely, extremely valuable. You know, and... Um, yes, if we find a diary by someone who was there at the marriage and, and you know, talks about it, yes, we'll, you know, compare the two. But without, you know, without that contemporary documentation, you know, this is a very valuable source. And, um, you know, and some people, some people say, no, it's valuable because it shows how, Helen Marr felt about it, you know, and, you know, I disagree with that. I think it's valuable because it's a, a, a record, a valuable record of what happened in history. And um, it's not perfect, you know, but no historical record is perfect. Contemporary records are not perfect. Um, in, in diaries, if you have a certain event happen, let's say a controversial event, one, let's say, and we're lucky, both of them keep a diary, Let's say, for instance, if they have an argument, okay? So, and they both go home and they write in their diaries that very same day. They'll be very, um, each will be biased toward their own point of view. You, you get these biases in contemporary sources. Um, uh, he said, she said kind of a thing, right? Yeah, and we have um, John D. Lee diary talking about Jacob Hamlin and conflicts they had. And John D. Lee, he was very, um, he kept a wonderful diary. I'm amazed that these people found time to, to keep diaries, you know. But he, he was very egotistic, you know, and that comes through in a lot of diaries. And, you know, it's a very human thing. So with these conflicts he had with Jacob Hamlin, well, one thing I say is, well, you know, this is what Lee said, but it would be great to have Jacob Hamblin's version of, of what, what was going on here. And um, just, to, you know, so I let people know that there's another side and we don't have it. You know, and that's one problem with contemporary sources is often we don't have those sources where we'd like them. So anyway, so... Helen Mark kept this wonderful diary memoir, which she gave to her kids about how she married Joseph Smith and how incredibly painful it was to her and to her mother. And how, aside from 
you know, just this ceiling connection of the two families. Um, Joseph Smith told her, a 14-year-old, if you, you know, go through with this marriage with me, you'll be saved for eternity. You'll have exaltation, but not only you, but your family, you know. And so that, what a, you know, it's a horrible thing to say to a 14-year-old to try to get her to marry you, you know. Very manipulative. That, you know, I don't, I don't know if I would call it manipulative. I have this, you know, real moderate streak, you know, so I have to apologize for that. No, don't, no apology <laughs> necessary. Because she, like, um, Heber C. Kimball and Joseph Smith might have been very sincere in wanting to link their families, and this is how you did it, through ceilings. But, you know, I don't think it was a good way to link, you know, and I don't think it was good to put a woman of any sort, but especially a 14-year-old in that position. So, um, so, let's see, where were we? <laughs> so do you have any uh, anything you can add from Alan Marr in the, the documents book that you oh, have here that okay. you'd like to share? Okay, so every woman left different kinds of documents and um, a different, you know, selection of documents. And some women, women left lots of documents and, you know, others just left a letter, you know. And that's all we know about that woman from a primary source, from what she wrote. But Helen Marr, she, she wrote an extensive autobiography that was published in Women's Exponent about mostly about um, Nauvoo and her growing up before Nauvoo and then crossing the plains and winter quarters. And, um, and then she, you know, she wrote that, that private memoir of her marriage to Joseph Smith, to her kids. And then she started keeping a diary later in her life. And so we have extensive diaries from her later in her life. And um, so I was, I helped publish those diaries. So those are available, Utah State University Press. You know, they're, they're long past Nauvoo, obviously, right. but it's very interesting, you know, every now and then she looks back toward Nauvoo. Right. And this is another thing I found out with all of these, a lot of these women is, um, they're looking, you know, in their later lives, sometimes they're known as plural wives of Joseph Smith. And so they're, they're sought out, you know, can you tell us, you know, what happened? Can you write the autobiography, your autobiography and, and so on. And they're looking back toward Nauvoo and there's this backward, backward, um, vision in their later lives. And, and as, uh, I guess I, I should say, uh, when I, I when I was back at the Huntington, starting to write these first these mini biographies and then extensive outlines of their lives, I got interested in their later lives. You know, and the Eliza R. Partridge diary is a, is one example of how I got interested in their later lives. But you know, and some you know some some really fine scholars have focused on. Nauvoo and Joseph Smith's polygamy, and that's t totally valid, you know. And they're kind of interested in the plural wives as, you know, helping to tell the story of Joseph Smith and his polygamy, and that's entirely valid and helpful. However, I got interested in in the women themselves, you know, and partially through Eliza Partridge Lyman, and. Um, so uh, I tell the whole story of their lives, you know. And so one thing that I found out was in Nauvoo, their marriage to Joseph Smith was very, very, their marriages were very, very secret, you know. And it was illegal uh, according to state law in Nauvoo. And Joseph Smith was very worried about legal liability throughout his life and from Kirtland on. And so 
he, you know, he swore everyone to secrecy when he introduced them to polygamy. And um, did masonry help with the secrecy? Yeah, yeah there's that, that there's that connection of. Um, and again, you'd have to read Cheryl Bruno's book. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, masonry really emphasized secrecy. And so I think some people, I think Cheryl believes that this Masonic demand for secrecy kind of was, was connected with this polygamy demand for secrecy. And um, so, but anyway, so... It was um, later, they, Joseph Smith died, and they remarried, and often they remarried apostles who felt they had a duty to, to uh, marry Joseph Smith's widows. And so Heber C. Kimball and Brigham Young married a number um, of Joseph Smith's plural wives. And then they went, obviously they went, to Utah, and um, so, however, in Utah, plural marriage wasn't secret. It was open, you know, and they could live openly. You know, the wives of Brigham Young could live openly in his household. At and, least after 1852, right? <laughs> well, there even was, before they were kind of, you know, they were kind of living it openly. Everyone knew about it. Uh -huh. Okay, before that, but they made a public, in print, you know announcement of it to the world in 1852. Um, but anyway, it was a different kind of polygamy in Utah than it had been in Nauvoo. Okay, so because I was, I included that, you know, the latter part of their lives, I recorded what their lives were like in polygamy, like in the Brigham Young household and um, Emily Partridge, Smith Young kept a very interesting diary of her marriage to, to Brigham Young and what it was like to live in his household. And she was, she had real financial problems. Um, at the same time, she was in, in the household, you know, she was in the plural family of, of Brigham Young. And he was quite wealthy. Um, and so that's a really interesting diary. And why was why did she have this problem with Brigham Young? And when she needed things, you know, it, it was totally different than this kind of monogamous family that we're used to, you know, now where you everyone in the family sees, you know, like. The wife and the kids see the father every day, and the father sees the wife and the kids every day. And that wasn't what it was like in Emily Partridge's household. And if she wanted to talk to Brigham Young, she made an appointment. And she would sit in the office and wait and make this. And she was really nervous, you know, as she was waiting, because often she was requesting things. And she was a pretty young wife too, wasn't she? When she married Brigham Young, yeah. And I'm not telling the whole story. Um, Got to read the book for that. You know, but <laughs> all I'm saying is that I found often there were these problems with polygamy where the husband was absent. And um, so there were financial problems for the wife and there were emotional issues. Um, and different wives had different relationships with the husband and sometimes they were they called them like the favorite wife and um, and other wives were not you know and Emily Partridge was not a, a, a favorite wife at that point and um, there were, often the favorite wife was a younger wife and so there was this tension between the older wives and the the younger wives and you'd have how, you know, situations where it's difficult, where the older wives are watching their husband go out and and court a younger wife, and very, very, you know, emotionally disturbing for the older wives. 
And um, so I, I found these patterns and um, that gave the book the title, In Sacred Loneliness. It was, um, Cause I found that. They were lonely. Yeah. And there were, there were different types of plural marriages and different types of relationships in plural marriages. And some plural families were more successful than others. And um, some were, you know, Brigham Young had like 56 wives. Most of them separated from him at some point. And um, so he had children with only like about, what was it, 20, 19, something like that. And, Out of um, how many? Well, he had like 56 wives, and then he had like he had kids with like 19 wives, and he ended up with 56 kids, something like that. And um, but you know, you also had polygamous families where the husband had two wives, and you know. If you have a, that's very different. That was a very different experience from a family where the husband had, you know, twenty or more wives, or even ten or more wives. And because um, there was, I mean, you physically just can't see them every day. Right. right. Yeah. And um, so that that kind of gave the title of my book. It's one of the main themes of my book, you know, what the experience was like for women in, in polygamy. And um, so in, in modern polygamy, there's a um, good book. And I haven't made that a focus of my study, but right. uh, there's a good book. Uh, the author is G-I-N-A-T. There's plural. There's two, at least two authors. I forget the other author, but he did lots of interviews with with modern polygamists, and um, I found some of the same issues. Oh, and we should add when we're talking about the number of wives, you can see like the more wives you had, the more problematic it would be, and um, in in at during the time of Joseph Smith, they kind of he kind of developed the the doctrine that first he developed the doctrine that to gain the highest exaltation you had to be a polygamist. Right. Okay. And then he kind of using certain scriptures, he added onto that that the more you know, the greater your family, the more wives you had, and the more you know children you had with these more wives you know, again, the greater your exaltation. And so there was this religious motivation to have, you know, a, a large family, to have a lot. And so that's one of the reasons you had these, you know, really big families, like Heber C. Kimball's family and Brigham Young's family. At the same time, you know, you had this religious motivation to get the, uh, the large family the larger the family you had, the more problematic it was for the women. You know, like there was less financial help, you know, there was less emotional help. Um, and often what happened was the plural wife, when her kids grew up, she was dependent upon them, you know, for both emotional and, and economic help. So there's just a little explanation of, of the, the title of the book, you know, and my, that interpretation of polygamy and, um, and um, one of the problems with, with polygamy. So one other question, jumping back to... Uh, and, oh, I was going to mention in that book, some of the same issues... You know, oh, the modern polygamy book. Yeah, like I remember in the book, this man had, and apparently they they have this. You know, they picked it up, I guess, from Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. You know, that this religious motivation to have a lot of wives. So you have some of these modern polygamists with lots 
of, of wives, you know. And anyway, in this one account in this book by Jeanette, um, the, the polygamist said, so he had a system where he would, was very equal in, in his visits to his wives. And I think he had like 25 or something like Three, that. Wives. Wow. Yeah. And so he would visit one one night, one the other night, you know, and it was all, you know, they, the wives knew when he would be there to visit. And, um, but then um, there'd be, one of the kids would have a birthday, you know, and obviously they had often had large families, each wife, you know, six or seven kids, you know. Probably shared birthdays. Well, they'd have a birthday, and so they'd have a birthday party, and the husband would want to be at the birthday party, and he would try to be at the birthday party, and he found it really difficult because he was scheduled to be with another wife and another family at the time of the birthday party. And um, so eventually he decided he couldn't go to birthday parties, this particular person who was interviewed in this book. And um, so just showing how split up you were as the husband, split by your number, you know, your numerous families, especially if you have a large polygamous family. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I think we, um, I wrote these small, small bios that turned into bigger bios, and eventually I, you know, turned them into narratives, which was an adventure for me. I'd never written this kind of narrative or history before, and fortunately it worked out, and, um, and uh, without going into details, it eventually got published. And I didn't know if, you know, I developed this really strong connection, emotional connection with these women. And um, their writing was, was wonderful. And um, so I didn't know if other people would be affected like I was, but um, uh, other people have been. And so the book has had a readership and um, other people are affected too. So. That's great. <laughs> Can I jump back to uh, the Partridge sisters, Emily and Eliza? Um, is there evidence, because what I've heard is they were married secretly to Joseph, and then Emma gave permission to marry them, so then they had a second sham ceremony, sealing ceremony with Emma present, and then... Um, and then Emma was surprised to find out that these were physical relationships, right? And yeah. Then, then she demanded a watch or a necklace or something like that. I can't remember what it was. That's a different wife. That's, oh. I think that's. Okay. <laughs> that's too Des Desdemona. Oh, okay. You know, it's oh, Desdemona it Fulmer. Partridge sisters. But anyway, um, so do we have evidence that Emily that Emma actually did? give permission for Joseph to marry the Partridge sisters? Well, this is um, mostly from the memoir of Emily Partridge Young. Okay. Okay. And as I mentioned, uh, her sister, Eliza Partridge Lyman, was a fine writer, you know, really wonderful writer. And not meaning as a sophisticated well-educated writer, but as a writer who could express her emotions, like in her diary and in her memoirs and so on. And um, Emily was, was the same way. And so Emily kept this, you know, wrote this full memoir of her marriage to Joseph Smith. Okay? And again, it's late. But again, you know, it's a really vivid diary. And uh, again, let me... Let me just go in a little bit into this because some people are saying it's late, we're going to we're going to throw out all late diaries. It sure makes it easy right. to say that Joseph didn't practice polygamy if you do oh, that, yeah. though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, that's right. We are getting people who are absolutely denying that Joseph right. didn't practice polygamy, aren't we? And um, anyway, let, let me. My dad was um, 
in World War II, and he was training to be an airplane mechanic. Okay, and so they shipped him. He started in Utah, you know, and they shipped him to different military posts across the country, and he got trained in a different thing in each post. And I, and um, so anyway, one one day, and he was he was in his 90s, you know, 92 or something like that, and. Um, and I said, Dad, tell me about, you know, World War II, your experience in World War II. And he, you know, with no looking at any notes or anything, he just went through. He said, I went here first, you know, and I learned about this. And I knew such and such people, and they were wonderful people. And, and then I went to the, this next post in Texas, and this is what I did here. You know, his memory was really vivid. And um, obviously, if we'd had a diary, we could have filled in the exact dates when he went from place to place. But his memory was very vivid of him going to these different places. He knew the names of the people he, he ran into in these places. And he remembered them with great affection, you know, and fondness. And, um, you know, and so I wrote this down. I wrote all this down, and I have this little oral history I took with him when when he was ninety, when he was ninety three, and um, and that's a really important historical document. His memory was very vivid. He remember, remembered lots of details. Okay, and um, so that for me, you know, that's a important, valid historical document. If Emily Partridge gives her memories of her marriage to Joseph Smith, to me, that's an important, valid document. Okay, now, with late documents, you have certain issues, you know, and one is, often you don't have the exact dates. They get the dates wrong. They get the year wrong. You know, that's very typical of, of I call them retrospective writing, you know, but that doesn't mean that my dad didn't go to these different places. He didn't participate in World War II. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's the same thing with, with Emily Partridge. Unless you think that she's totally, you know, incredibly dishonest and has a very vivid, you know, is just totally making it up. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of, you know, so um, I know myself I have vivid memories of going to third grade in Central School in Alamosa, Colorado, and the name of the teacher, Mrs. Lobato, who yelled at me, you know, and I don't remember the date of my third grade, <laughs> you know, and I could go, you know, and I could go look it up, you know, and check with my siblings and, and find out if any of them have documents, and I might have documents myself. You know, and so that's what you need to do if you're worried about the dates, you know, the exact dates, as you see if you have other sources to help, you know, make the bigger picture. But, you know, and evidence works with other evidence when you're a historian, you know. You, you find all the evidence you can and you put it together like a puzzle. And the evidence, it really helps. One document really helps another document, okay. But... What I'm saying is that late, you can't just reject late documents. You can't reject a memoir, okay? So, where was I? Okay, so all of this um, business about the two marriages, you know, I think mostly it's from the Emily Partridge diary and um, memoir, okay? And it's very vivid, um, and it's, it's a, a wonderful piece of storytelling, and... Um, You know, but there are some problems, okay? And one is, she, um, both she and her sisters gave affidavits um, about that second marriage. And they gave the date May 11th. And um, I think they said Emma was there. And we, you know, look into other documentation, and Emma wasn't at home on May 11th. Okay, so that's a problem. Okay, and so 
what people have done is they said, okay, we think, we think this happened like Emily Partridge said, you know, but we think we, she, she got the dates wrong, which is very typical of, of memoirs. You know, and I think anyone would have that problem if they were, you know, talking about their earlier life. They wouldn't get the dates right. And um, so uh, there's a problem with that May 11th date, you know, but other people have suggested other dates that are possible. And so, um, but I, I accept her story. I accept her that document is, is what happened. And um, she said that Emma was wonderful to them. They were living in, in the home of Joseph Smith and Emma. And um, they were helping tend the kids, help with the kids, kind of like governesses type, type thing. And um, Emily and Eliza's father had died Edward Partridge, and um, so you had this large family that needed help, and um, so it helped that Emily and Eliza got to live in in the Smith home, and in the mansion house, right? I, I think it was the mansion house, yeah, and um, eventually their mother remarried. Interestingly enough, the father of Zina, Diantha, Huntington, Smith, Young, and Prosendia, Huntington, Smith, Kimball. Um, and so, um, so they were very, they, they said uh, Emma was wonderful to them, you know, when they were living in the home, and Joseph was too. And however, after the marriage, Emily says, um, Emily, um, Emma turned against us right then. And there were big arguments with Joseph. And eventually, Emma had them kicked out of the house. And so they had to find other places to live. And um, so it, you know, it shows how difficult it was for Emma. And, um, and Emily kind of blamed Joseph Smith, you know, like, here you married us, and then all of a sudden you're kicking us out of the house. You know, and she didn't feel that was right, you know, but she kind of, she, she kind of said, you know, looking back on it, you know, and we get this way as we get older, we get more forgiving, you know, you know. She was more forgiving toward Joseph Smith and felt she knew how difficult it was for him dealing with Emma and his situation as prophet of the church and so on. Um, so, um, so that's my evaluation of that, that story that, you know, I believe there were the two marriages, uh, the May 11th date, probably we should look for a different date. Okay. Um, and some people have suggested other dates. So. May 11th is the second date, right? Right, yeah. And they had, um, so they had married Joseph Smith secretly. These were all secret, really secret marriages. And Emily's, Emily and Eliza didn't even know about how they had married Joseph Smith. Um, the first time. The first time. And eventually, Emily told Eliza even though Joseph Smith had told, to, to, told them not to. Um, and uh, so, but he, you know, that was when he, he hadn't told Emma. So he really hadn't, that's another thing that, that was on Brian Hale's list of, you know, he should have told Emma before any of these marriages he felt. You know, yeah. and that that's true. You know, and I think that would have been great for uh, the rest of the history of polygamy in Utah if the, the they had this ideal of the first wife. You had to get permission of the first wife. You know, talk with the first wife and get her permission, and then 
they called it the law of Sarah, and she would give the hand of the new wife into the hand of the, the husband. And so that was the ideal, but often it didn't work like that. Often the first wife didn't know when the husband was thinking of adding another wife, and she was not happy about it. She was not consulted. And, um, but it would have been good if they could have you know, kept with that ideal through, through, all through Utah. The first wife often had, it was very, you know, often the first wife had the most difficult experience. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes the first wife was one that the husband was most attached to. And so he never had the connection with the other wives that he had with the first wife. And that's kind of how it was with Heber C. Kimball. He had this really close attach, attach, attachment with the late Kimball. And um, he had these younger wives, and he had children with these younger wives, but he never quite had the attachment that he had with Valate. So that's another example of this inequality of attachment in practical, I call it practical polygamy in Utah. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Todd Compton. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about the dating of the Fanny Alger incident with Joseph Smith. Was it as early as 1833 when Fanny was just 16 years old? Brian Hales, in his book, Brian, yeah. he accepts the Fanny Alger story, I mean the Levi Hancock story, and Bushman accepts it too. Okay. However, then, even though there's this connection with the marriage of Clarissa Reed to Levi. In 1833. Yeah. Who I think you've got to, you're kind of stuck with that 1833 mm -hmm. um, date. He dates it to 1835. Right. And he says, he, he says the Benjamin, the Benjamin Johnson document supports 1835. And this is an interesting example of how you're using two documents, you know, to, to create the whole story. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks.